Genesis 6:18, 7, 11 through 24, and 8, 1 through 19. Hear now the word of the Lord as he speaks through the prophet Moses. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with him entered the ark, they and every beast according to its kind, and all livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God commanded, and the Lord shut him in. The flood continued forty days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them fifteen cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. Man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, they were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ar Arat. And the waters continued to abate until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he made and sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah, Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him any more. In the six hundred and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Then God said to Noah, Go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. This is God's holy and inspired word. The grass withers, the flower fades. Well, if you look at the title of the sermon, it is The Flood and Eschatology. The Flood and Eschatology. Well, hopefully by now we're familiar with the flood. But what is this strange word, eschatology? What is eschatology? What does it mean? What does eschatology mean? Well, simply put, 
Eschatology, which comes from the Greek word eschaton, just means the end times. A study of the end times. That's what eschatology is. A study of the end times. Now the flood is judgment. Remember that? The flood is judgment. So today what we're going to do is make connections between floods of judgment and the end times. Floods of judgment and the end times. Because what what I want us to realize as Bible readers, as people who love and read the word, I want us to realize that just because eschatology refers to the end times, that does not mean that there are different mini eschatons, mini judgment days all throughout scripture. And indeed, there are. There are many judgment days, floods of judgment that overcome people. Floods of judgment. Eschatology, the eschaton, peeking in before the actual end times. Breaking into time and space. Breaking into the history of God's people. So eschatology, study of the end times, the eschaton, the end times, when Jesus returns on the clouds with the angels with him, in the power of God in order to judge the living and the dead. That is the eschaton. But guess what? We see little pictures of that, many eschatons, all throughout Scripture. They come in floods of judgment. Precursors of the final judgment. Types of the final end times judgment. So the purpose of the sermon this morning is this. The flood... The flood is a type of eschatological judgment that will come upon all mankind when Christ returns. For those who are in Christ, they are saved from the judgment. For those who are not in Christ, they are sent into the lake of fire. The flood is a type of eschatological judgment that will come upon all mankind when Christ returns. For those who are in Christ, for those who are in the ark, for those who are in Christ, they will inherit the kingdom of heaven. But for those who are not, who are outside of the ark, who are outside of Christ, they will inherit the eternal lake of fire. We're going to see this from three different perspectives this morning. The first perspective that we're going to look at is the eschatological flood of judgment in the days of Adam. The eschatological flood of judgment in the days of Adam. Second, the eschatological flood of judgment in the days of Noah. The eschatological flood of judgment in the days of Noah. Third, the eschatological flood of judgment in the days of Moses. So easy enough to remember, right? There's eschatological Floods of judgment, precursors of the final judgment, types of the final judgment, breaking into time and space, breaking into the history of God's people as many judgments. And we're going to look at it in the days of Adam, in the days of Noah, and the days of Moses. Okay? All right. So where should we start? How about we start at the beginning? We'll start at the beginning. The eschatological flood of judgment in the days of Adam. So think of how does the Bible start? How does the Bible begin? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And who's there? The Spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters. The Spirit of God hovering like a bird over the face of the waters, waiting for the word to say, create, go, give life. That's what the Spirit does. You know that, right? The Nicene Creed, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. He waits for the word, the decree of God the Father, the word of God the Son to say, create. And he goes and he makes everything out of nothing. The Spirit is hovering, fluttering over the face of the waters, waiting for the word. God spoke, And it was. God spoke and it was. God spoke and it was. And and after the sixth day, after he creates all things, God looks around and he says, it is very good. Creation is very good. Which makes sense since he's the one who created it, right? And then what happens? 
got this beautiful creation. Then he takes man and he places man in the garden. He puts Adam in the garden, right? And we said that's a covenant of works because he tells Adam, do this and live. Obey my commands. Don't eat from that tree. You can have any tree you want, but don't eat from that tree because that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you eat it that day, you will die dead. You will surely die. Covenant of works. By working, by keeping the works of the law, Adam would gain life, eternal life for him and all his posterity because he's the covenantal representative. But what did Adam do? We know what Adam did, right? Fail. Because the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God made. Remember this? And there's that discussion between the serpent, Satan, as he inhabits the snake, and he's trying to convince Eve, did God really say? Now, anytime, anytime you hear that, go the other direction, right? Did God really say? What do we just hear in Revelation 22? Anyone who takes from the, the word of God, anyone who adds to the word of God, let them be accursed. That's exactly what Satan does here in this discussion with Eve. Did God really say, eh, he didn't really mean that. He's just jealous of you. He doesn't want you to be like him. He wants to keep you in your place. He doesn't want you to be like him. But seeing that it was a delight to the eyes and that it was good to eat, Eve took and she gave some to her husband who was with her. What should Adam have done? What should he have done right then and there? He should have crushed the head of the serpent, right? That was his job, to guard the holy mountain temple sanctuary where God resides, where God is present. This is his holy mountain temple sanctuary, and he puts Adam in charge as prophet, priest, and king, and says, make sure nothing accursed comes into my temple. And as soon as something cursed comes into the temple, he gives in. He's weak. This is... The covenant of works broken. The covenant of works broken. And then what happens? They know right away that something's wrong. They know that they're naked. They know right away. And then they hear something. They hear the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. The sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Remember that? In the cool of the day. That a nice, it's a nice breezy evening, the sun's gone down, and it's a nice cool evening, and all of a sudden they hear God walking. It's, it's not a good translation. We said that when we talked about this, Judgment Day, Genesis 3. We talked about that. that's a bad translation, because really the Hebrew text actually says they heard the voice of Yahweh coming in the garden. They heard the voice of Yahweh coming in the garden in the spirit of the day. In the spirit of the day. Not the cool of the day. It's not a romantic thing. God is coming in judgment. God comes in judgment. You want to know what they heard? I've always wondered, what exactly did they hear? Want to know what they heard? If you have a Bible, turn to Exodus 20, verse 18. This is the the best part of the Ten Commandments, right? God thunders his law from Mount Sinai. It says, here's all the laws. Do them and live. Don't do them and die. They said, we're going to do it. Don't worry. We'll do all of the... Remember that? God thunders his law from Mount Sinai. But by the time he's done thundering the law from Mount Sinai, what's the response of the people? Exodus 20, verse 18. They're not so excited about the law anymore, are they? They're scared. When all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and they trembled and they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we'll listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Kind of sounds like what happened in the garden, doesn't it? But there's no trees for the people of God to hide behind, so they hide behind Moses. But that's exactly what Adam and Eve heard. They heard the thunder. They saw the flashes of lightning, the mountain smoking, fire. They heard God coming in judgment. They heard the sound of the trumpet blaring. He's coming in judgment. I love what one author says, Genesis scholar. He says, they heard the sound of Yahweh coming in the garden. It should be rendered like this. The Lord came in the spirit of judgment day in the terrifying spirit theophany heralded by thunder and trumpet. 
In other words, when God is coming to them, he's coming in judgment. It's not cool of the day. It's he's coming in the spirit in judgment in order to judge them for their sin. And that's exactly what he does. And he pours out a flood of eschatological judgment on them. He pours out a taste of the end times judgment on them right then and there. And they think, rightly so, that this will be their last moment. That they're about to die. Because this is a taste of the eschaton breaking into history. And God pours out this flood of judgment upon them in the form of curses. To the woman, to the man, pours out curses. Remember that? I will multiply your pain in childbearing. Cursed is the ground because of you. By sweat and toil you will eat bread. And then you will die. First I'm going to make you suffer and be in pain. Then I'll let you die. This is the end time judgment, the eschaton making an appearance in history. Judgment. But even in judgment, God is gracious. God is gracious. Genesis 3.15, he preached the gospel to them. They're facing death, and then he says this, Genesis 3.15, the offspring of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. He will crush the serpent's head. And they heard that gospel, and they believed And God covered them with animal skins. So they hear the gospel, they believe, God covers their sins. Instead of dying dead, they passed through this judgment. Why? Because God covered them by the shedding of blood. By the shedding of blood, they were covered. So instead of dying, they passed through this judgment covered in blood. That judgment that was due for Adam's sin... It was poured out on someone or something else. It was poured out on the animals whose skins and whose blood now covered Adam and Eve as they passed through judgment. And as they pass through this judgment, they enter into this new world because they're cast from the garden, aren't they? So they leave that world that they're used to, the garden, the beautiful garden with the abundant rivers of life. Remember the four rivers? Remember all the names, right? The gold, the onyx, beautiful place, everything you need. They're leaving that, and God sends them into this new world, the fallen world, the groaning creation world, the cursed world. So they are judged, they pass through the judgment, but then they enter into this new world. And this is what God does all throughout history. Because of sin, he pours out judgment, and for those who hear and believe him, who believe the promise, they pass through that judgment covered in blood, and they enter into a new world. Here, it's the world that then was. Remember the world that then was series? We spent several months on the world that then was, moving now into our second consideration. The world that then was starts with Adam and Eve's children and goes all the way to the days of Noah. So they left that world, they enter this new world, the world that then was. Now, when God first created, he looked around, he said, behold, it is very good. But he doesn't say that with this new world, does he? In fact, it's the exact opposite. Because as soon as Adam and Eve have children, you see murder. You see strife. You see enmity. You see violence, sin, corruption. Cain kills Abel out of jealousy because God accepts Abel's worship and not his. Then Cain builds his own city, the city of man. He names it after his son. He doesn't name it after God. He names it after his son. Arrogance, right? The opposite of humility. And then what happens next? Sons of God start intermarrying with the daughters of men, in other words, non-believers, and then they start having non-believing children, and then before you know it, there's no one left except for Noah and his family. And God surveys the world, and he looks and he says, Behold, this world is full of sin, violence, and corruption. So what do you think God does? Pours out a flood of eschatological judgment. Previously, in the days of Adam, it was in the form of curses. But this is in the form of an actual flood. And that's what the flood is, beloved. It's judgment. God is pouring out. He's giving them a taste of the eschaton, the judgment that kills. He's pouring it out now on the world, on sin. Think about it. The flood is a preview of the last day. The flood is a preview of of the judgment that comes when Christ returns. It's eschatological judgment. 
One difference, though, when Christ returns and the world is judged, it will be by fire. This is water. The world is judged here by water as a preview of what's in store for sinners on the last day. Think about it. Everyone who's not in the ark, everyone who's not in Christ, as we've said week after week, everyone who's not in Christ will be destroyed. Those who are in the ark that is in Christ, what happens to them? Same flood of judgment, right? It's the same waters that destroy everybody, but for Noah and his family, for the church, those waters are salvation. You see that? Same water that killed everybody else is salvation for Adam, for Noah and his family. Peter even calls it what? He says that was their baptism through which they are saved. And we heard why they're saved, not just because it's water, but because it's spiritually connected to the resurrection of Christ. The floodwaters are spiritually connected to the resurrection of Christ. And for those who are in Christ, they pass through this judgment. They're saved. And whoever is not in Christ, because there is no connection between non-believers and the resurrection of Christ or any of Christ's work, there's no connection, therefore they're destroyed. This is a picture of the last day's judgment. Okay? You see that? You see what's happening here? This is what God does. There's sin, right? And then he pours out this flood of eschatological judgment. And those who believe, those who are in him, are saved from that flood of judgment. And everyone else is destroyed. This is a picture of the final judgment that comes. And, and what happens, right? What, what do we see towards the end of the flood, the, the deluge, right? What does Noah send out? Well, first of all, in Genesis 8.1, what does it say? Genesis 8.1. God remembered. What did he remember? He remembered the covenant that he made with Noah that said, get on the ark and I'll save you. So it's covenant, it's covenant of grace. He remembers, and then what does he do? He sends out his, chapter 8, verse 1, what does it say? He sends out his wind. Wind. Why did they translate it wind? In Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, they translated that same exact word a little bit differently. What does it say in in Genesis 1, 2? That same exact word is translated wind. Spirit. Why did they change the translation? I don't know. But it's meant to make us think of something. God sent out his spirit. What's that meant to make us think of? Creation. Creation. Also, what does Noah send out? He sends out a dove. A dove. What kind of animal is a dove? It's a bird. What was the spirit doing in Genesis 1-2? Hovering like a bird over the waters. Just like this dove is now hovering over, finding where's the dry land. So what do we have here? We're meant to think of Genesis 1-2, not creation, but recreation. Recreation. This is what God does. He pours out the flood of eschatological judgment for those who are in Christ. They cross through the waters of baptism. They cross through through the blood And they pass into this new world. As the ark came to rest, they went into a new world. That was not the world that then was. They're entering into a new world, the post-flood world. The world that now is. So you've seen what's happening here? You see this pattern over and over? Guess what? You see it again. When do you see it again? In the days of Moses. In the days of Moses. What did the eschatological flood of judgment look like in the days of Moses? Covered in the blood of the Passover lamb, Israel left Egypt, right? So they're leaving one world, and they're entering into a new world, the promised land. They leave Egypt covered in the blood of the lamb, and what do they have to pass through first? Water, the Red Sea. Remember that? That great event where God tells Moses, do this, and then all of a sudden the sea parts. Did that really happen? Yeah, it really happened. And they passed through these waters. And what does, what does Paul tell us this is for Israel? It starts with a B. Ends with an aptism. Did you catch it? 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Our fathers, Paul says, were all under the cloud. 
Spirit. And all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They go covered in the blood of the Lamb. They go through water. They are baptized by the Spirit as they pass through the Red Sea. And what happens to those who followed them? From that sinful world of the Egyptians, slavery to sin, what happens to the Egyptians as they follow Israel through the, through the sea? God releases the waters, and it becomes a flood of eschatological judgment for those who do not believe. Right? Do you see that? Are you seeing this? Am I crazy? You see this, right? And as they, they go through the Red Sea, having been baptized, having been saved by the same waters that destroy the Egyptians, what happens? They go into the wilderness, they spend time in the wilderness, and who is there protecting them like a bird? Deuteronomy 32, 11, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, the Lord alone guided Israel. Do you see all the connections? Do you see this? It's pretty amazing, isn't it? This is what God does. He pours out his judgment on sin. It's a taste of that eschatological end times judgment. But because of the covenants of promise, God remembers and he saves his people. He brings them into a different world. For for Israel, it was the promised land. In the days of Adam, the spirit of judgment day, they passed through the blood, baptized by that blood, leaving the garden, entering into a new world, the world that then was in the days of Noah. It was the flood of judgment, passing through the waters, baptized by the same waters that destroyed everyone else. In the days of Moses, it was the sea of judgment, the same waters as they're covered by the blood, the same waters that they were baptized in, killed everyone else. These, beloved, are all types of eschatological judgment, typifying the final judgment in each event. God destroys non-believers because of their sin, according to the covenant of grace, and saves those who are in Christ. And you may be thinking, great, good information. What does it have to do with me? What does it have to do with us? Creation, sin, flood of judgment, new creation. What does this have to do with us? I'll give you a hint. Everything. Now, for us... There will be no mini eschaton. There's not going to be God peeking into time and space with an eschatological judgment. No. The only thing that we're looking forward to is the eschaton. The last days. The final judgment. There's not going to be a mini one. Only the real thing. And again, for us, when Christ returns on the clouds, it's not going to be through water. It's going to be fire. Listen to what Peter says. Peter warns us, 2 Peter 3, 6. He says, The world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar. I think we sang that earlier, didn't we? And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Final judgment. Christ will return on the clouds. The holy angels with him. And the power of God. Spirit of judgment day. Pouring out a, a flood of judgment upon those who are not in him. Are you ready for that day? Are you ready for that day of judgment? Are you ready for the real thing, the real eschaton when Christ returns and judges those who are not in him with fire, but judges those who are in him with open arms? Coming through his body and blood, that same water that washes us clean, that same blood that poured forth from his side, blood and water, that is how we enter into the new kingdom. That is how we enter into the new creation. It's only through water and through blood. You get that? You see that? Because Christ was baptized. Remember Christ's baptism? What was Christ's first baptism? It was in the Jordan where he identified with the sin of humanity. What was his second baptism? That was when the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus on the cross. Remember that? I have a baptism that I'm going to be baptized with with which you will not be baptized with. That's what Jesus says. His baptism is on the cross where that eschatological judgment is poured out on Jesus. 
It's poured out on him. Why? Why did he cry out, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani? Why did he cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Because God forsook him. God poured out judgment due for sin all on Jesus. The wages of sin is death. Somebody had to die. And that person is Jesus. And it's through water. It's through blood. It's through the waters of baptism that we pass into Christ. We heard this earlier, right? We're buried with him in death. We're buried in him on the cross. All of our sin was nailed to the cross. And we are raised to life with him in his resurrection. And that's what our baptism is a sign of. And we enter into this beautiful new creation. But here's the best part. Not only will we enter into the new creation on the day he returns, but we have a taste of this new creation now. Where? Where? 2 Corinthians 5.17. 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation right now. Beloved, are you in Christ Do you trust in Christ and his perfect life and his atoning death and his baptism on the cross for you? That that judgment that is due for you was poured out on him instead of you? Do you believe that? You are in Christ. And therefore, you are a new creation. So what do new creatures, new creations in Christ, how do we know if we are? We walk in newness of life. That's what Paul said, isn't it? You've been baptized into his death and you've raised with him in his resurrection therefore walk in newness of life what does that mean it means you have repented of your sin you have kneeled before the cross of our lord jesus you understand that the judgment that was due for you was poured out on him and you have been engrafted into him and therefore you love people even when they don't deserve love you forgive people even when they don't deserve forgiveness you are humble you are joyful These are marks of Christians. These are marks of those who are new creations in Christ. Does it describe you? Are you walking in newness of life? Are you walking in your baptism life? Are you constantly improving on your baptism? I want you when you go home to take a look at that improving on your baptism thing. Really, it's dying to sin and being conformed to the risen Lord Jesus Christ. So that on the last day when Christ returns, remember that beautiful picture that we saw in Revelation 22, we enter into the city, we walk into that new kingdom, new creation, and we see this beautiful river on either side of the tree of life with which we can eat and have life, and you see this beautiful river, and as you look up, where's that river coming from? It's coming from the throne of God himself. Wow. Beautiful, isn't it? That's the water that you have already passed through. That's the water that you drink from. As Jesus said, I will give as much as you need. Revelation 22, without price. Come, drink. Drink from this river. This is what we have to look forward to, beloved. This is what we have to look forward to. And the fact that we have the spirit now, that we've been baptized now, that is a down payment of the future glory that we have in Christ. Why? Because Jesus drank the cup of the wrath of God for us, and we are in him. Therefore, let us live like it.